All right, good morning, everyone. This is Scott Reeves, and this is FSN 328. And we're going to go through carbohydrate lecture number three. So hopefully you can hear me okay and that everything is um, set on PowerPoint. I guess one of the advantages of going through the lecture in this way is that, first of all, you don't have to sit in class. And then secondly, you can you know, kind of replay parts of this if you need to for your notes. So I would suggest that you take good notes on this. Um, I guess one of the disadvantages, though, is if you have any questions as we go through this, um, you can't ask them immediately. So I would encourage you, if you do have questions, make sure you take notes. And then the next time we meet in class or my office hours, we can go through any questions that you might have um, to clarify. So here's kind of an outline for lecture number three. We're going to kind of start off with an overview of how we're going to go from food to energy, looking at certain pathways you've gone through before in other classes. We're going to then kind of go through glycolysis in detail, and I think one of the points that we're going to go with glycolysis is that we're going to look at its regulation, and then we're going to kind of look at what are some of the options of pyruvate once it's generated. Then we'll specifically look at galactose and fructose metabolism, and we'll put those monosaccharides in the context of glycolysis, talk about how they might have some commonality or differences in their metabolism. So the bottom note is that we'll not have time to cover the hexose monophosphate shunt or ethanol metabolism in this class. So your textbook mentions those, gives some information on those pathways. We won't go through that in, in FSN 328, so just FYI on that. So let's go ahead and look at an overview of um, how do we get energy from food. And this is a diagram that I took out of a biochemistry text. And it shows up at the top. The, it has food and then it shows it broken into the, the main macronutrients, or the only macronutrients, sorry, the proteins, polysaccharides, and fats. And it indicates that all of them start off as unique molecules. And they're broken down from large macromolecules to their simpler subunits. At that point, they are still unique molecules. We have amino acids, the simple sugars, for example, glucose, and then fatty acids and glycerol from fats. Because most of the time when we say fats, we're referring to triglycerides. Then you'll see as these molecules work their way down a metabolic pathway, they can become the same molecules. For example, if we look at amino acids, they can become pyruvate, and so can simple sugars like glucose as they go through glycolysis. Now, if you look at this, amino acids can kind of bypass glycolysis and become pyruvate. But pyruvate is one of the main ways that our metabolic pathways lead to acetyl-CoA. Remember, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA is a unidirectional reaction. We don't go from acetyl-CoA to pyruvate. But if we get to pyruvate, and then we can go to acetyl-CoA. That means that both glucose, for example, and certain amino acids can do that. Fatty acids, on the other hand, and glycerol can also become acetyl-CoA, but they do not become pyruvate. And we'll, if you remember, it's mostly fatty acids that do that. Fatty acids become acetyl-CoA. So all three of these macronutrients can, be, can become acetyl-CoA. And we know that acetyl-CoA is one of the important molecules because it leads, to, it's, it's leads into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And between the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, that's where we get about 90% of our ATP on a daily basis. So those are, that's an important thing to think about is that all of the macronutrients can provide substrate for Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle is what is providing electrons for ETC overall. So if we now look at this, and, and the main power output on this is going to be the last part where it says electron transport. There are... One of the main points of the Krebs cycle is to provide electrons for ETC. The Krebs cycle itself doesn't generate a lot of ATP, but it provides most of the electrons for electron transport chain. So if we look down at the bottom, we can see that's the major point of ATP production. We have 
Um, also, the requirement of oxygen is shown. Hopefully, you can see the cursor. So here's oxygen that's needed to combine with electrons and protons to make water. And remember, no oxygen, ETC won't run because there's not a terminal electron acceptor. Right, so that's where most of our ATP comes from, and all of the macronutrients can participate in these metabolic pathways to get to ETC. If we look over here for amino acids, we also have the ability of amino acids to become pyruvate. And in liver cells, if we have pyruvate, we can go to glucose. So gluconeogenesis is the reverse of this. So we're going to look at that as well in the next lecture. And if we look over here, we have amino acids. What what makes them unique is the presence of nitrogen. So as amino acids are metabolized, their carbon skeletons, or most of the molecule, basically can contribute into pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, and Krebs cycle, and the nitrogen has to be removed and eliminated as waste, or sometimes it's used um, to make other nitrogen-containing products. All right? so as we also know, as we go through this, we're generating CO2. So we're generating CO2, we're utilizing oxygen, so this part of our metabolic pathways are basically respiration. One of the main points of this to keep in mind is that we get most of our energy from food by oxidizing some of its components. And remember when we say oxidizing, we're basically pulling electrons from molecules. And the electrons can then be used to drive ETC. So that's how we get most of the energy from food. One of the other things to look at is carbohydrates are the central part of metabolism. They can provide most of the energy under certain conditions. In certain conditions, they're the only source of energy for certain cells. Remember, glycolysis is the only anaerobic option that we have to generate ATP. Okay, so we're going to continue on with this. So let's review a few things. One of the things we've talked about is tissue-specific metabolism. In this case, tissue-specific energy pathways. So we have at least four different cell types here. We have red blood cells, brain, cells in the brain or brain cells. We have muscle fibers or muscle cells. And over here we have the liver. So we're going to kind of review some of the metabolic options in each of these tissues. So let's, I think it's appropriate, let's start with the liver. Lots of things happening in liver cells. They have lots of metabolic ab options, and many of which they don't have in other cells. So let's say, for example, a glucose molecule goes into the liver cell, and you know from reviewing your notes that glucose goes into that liver cell through GLUT2. And we know that as if glucose accumulates, it can be exported back into the blood. Remember, the liver is the only tissue that, that helps regulate blood homeostasis of, of glucose. So the liver will contribute glucose to the blood to help maintain glucose for other tissues. But once glucose goes in, it can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate. We know if that's a liver cell, that's glucokinase that does that. Once we have glucose 6-phosphate, there are some options. Liver cells can convert glucose 6-phosphate actually to glucose 1-phosphate and then to glycogen. So we know liver cells can store glycogen. When they need to, they can convert glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate and then eventually to glucose, which can be released into the blood. Glucose 6-phosphate can also go through glycolysis to generate pyruvate. Okay, Liver cells can make some pyruvate. I'd say most of the time they don't do that. But remember, liver cells can take lactate. I don't know if I, I think I might have said that wrong. Most of the time in a liver cells, pyruvate don't become lac, doesn't become lactate. But it's common in liver cells for lactate to become pyruvate. Remember the Cori cycle where they're picking up the lactate um, and actually converting it to pyruvate. At that point, they could go through gluconeogenesis. Okay? But once a liver cell gets pyruvate, that pyruvate can go into the mitochondria. This inner circle here is the mitochondria. Be converted to acetyl-CoA and into the Krebs cycle to generate energy. It'll generate ATP. Then that ATP can be used within the liver cell to perform other functions or work. Now, 
in scenarios where there is high amounts of energy in the liver cells and the energy supply is continuous, the liver cells have the ability to take some of that, trying to get my cursor, take some of that citrate that's being generated, they'll release it from the mitochondria into the cytosol, the citrate then becomes acetyl-CoA, and then palmitate, and remember before we said palmitate is a fatty acid that can be used to make a triglyceride, and then the triglyceride can be converted or incorporated into a VLDL, and the VLDL can go into the blood to deliver that triglyceride to other tissues. So the liver cells can do that with carbohydrate. They can eventually generate a fatty acid, make triglycerides, and put it into the blood. So the liver cells have the ability to fat, to make fat, and export it into the blood as well. Okay? Don't pay attention to this part over here. Pentose phosphate, pentose phosphate pathway and glucuronides are things we're not going to talk about, so you can cross those out. Okay, so those are some of the important options for liver cells. Um, let's look at muscle. Muscle cells can take glucose in from the blood, convert it to glucose 6-phosphate, then to glycogen. Remember, they store glycogen. An important point of this, though, if they do take glycogen to glucose 6-phosphate when they need to, the glucose 6-phosphate doesn't become glucose and then get excreted into the blood. They'll take the glycogen, go to glucose 6-phosphate, and then to pyruvate, and they can use that for um, energy production. Under anaerobic conditions, the muscle fibers can go glycogen to glucose 6-phosphate to pyruvate through glycolysis. So in a high-intensity exercise, they'll go glucose 6-phosphate to pyruvate, and then they'll go lactate. Then they'll put lactate into the blood. Under aerobic conditions like resting conditions or low intensity exercise, um, if they're running on carbohydrate, the muscle fibers can actually uh, use the pyruvate to acetyl CoA and then use Krebs cycle. So they can get a lot of um, aerobic energy as well using Krebs cycle. And remember, muscle fibers can also utilize um, triglycerides to do this. Uh, so the muscle fibers can burn any carbohydrate or fat. We've talked about that before. Let's look at red blood cells. Red blood cells, basically their main function, transport oxygen. So they're full of hemoglobin. They don't do a lot of energy metabol metabolism, but they do glycolysis. Remember, there's no mitochondria. So they'll take in glucose. That's their only energy source. Convert it to glucose 6-phosphate and then go through pyruvate. Then they'll generate lactate and secrete that. They also run the pentose phosphate pathway, but we won't talk about that. We'll talk about that in 329. So pretty limited options for red blood cells. Over here in the brain. Normally the brain runs exclusively on glucose. We'll take up glucose, run it through glycolysis, generate pyruvate, then acetyl-CoA for Krebs cycle. So they'll get most of their energy from aerobic metabolism uh, when, um, and, it, and the source comes from, the carbon source comes from glucose when that's possible. Now, they're under certain conditions, when ketones are being generated, um, and Ketones are generated, remember, when there is a lack or inability to use carbohydrates. So, for example, during starvation or in diabetes when an individual is not incorporating glucose into their cells and utilizing it for energy, then they can actually generate ketones. Those ketones are an important energy source, and the ketones actually are used in, in aerobic metabolism. So they're actually used as substrate for the Krebs cycle as well. Is there an RDA for carbohydrates? Remember there is. We said it's 130 grams a day for adults, males and females. And there is one in order to basically provide an energy source and decrease the amount of um, ketogenesis. Okay, so there's a basic overview. And so when we talk more specifics, I think it'll be helpful for you to kind of keep going back and forth, like when we're talking about specifics in a cell, remember to always think about what cell types we're talking about. It's important that we understand cellular metabolism, but also how that affects the system as a whole.
All right, so we're going to go through some carbohydrate pathways. And here's some important items to know as we go through this. For example, you want to know the, the definition of a pathway, like what glycolysis is. And you would say the, the metabolism of glucose, one glucose molecules to two pyruvate molecules. You want to know the beginning and end product, including the structures of these molecules, and I'll indicate which structures you need to know. The significance of the pathway under specific conditions. For example, is this pathway upregulated or downregulated during fasting or postprandial conditions? You want to know the intracellular location, where it's occurring in a cell, in other words. And then tissue specificity, which tissues actually run this metabolic pathway. Um, and then the key enzymes of each pathway, including the regulation of these. So here's glycolysis. And I'm choosing to use this diagram. Um, this one is not the one in the latest edition of, sorry, latest edition of the textbook because uh, they've gone to more of a linear diagram. But I like this one because it shows galactose and it shows fructose incorporation. So I would encourage you to, to look at it in this way as well. Also, the, the glycolysis diagram in the sixth edition of the textbook, there's a mistake in there as far as how fructose is incorporated. So use this diagram for, um, I'd say, for most of your studies. Um, and with that said, there's a mistake on one of the structures of this diagram. So let me get my cursor. The structure for fructose 6-phosphate here is correct. This is the simplified Hayworth for that. The structure for fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is not correct. There should be the line extending through here on carbon number 2 because, remember, there's a hydroxyl group here. Over here on carbon number 5, there should not be a line here. There is not an OH here. So, remember this is fructose 6-phosphate, this is the correct structure. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate basically looks like this, but you would have the, shows the oxygen and the phosphate here. So make sure you correct that. Why don't we go through and I'll indicate which of these structures you need to be able to draw. So you might want to take notes on this. Boy, most of the first part of this, you need to know, be able to draw the structure of glucose. And I'd say these are in simplified Hayworths. You need to be able to draw the structure of glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 1-phosphate, galactose 1-phosphate, galactose, fructose 6-phosphate, Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, fructose, fructose 1-phosphate, and pyruvate. You don't need to know how to draw the structures of DHAP, etc., all the way through to, this is PEP is phosphoenyl pyruvate. You don't need to draw that one as well. Okay, so these three carbon molecules through here, you don't have to be able to draw their structure. Okay, so we'll focus on those structures and the regulation of glycolysis and basically what it's for. Okay, so let's take a quick peek here. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at glycolysis and ATP production. And again, this is kind of review. So here's glycolysis. Glucose to glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, through DHAP, G3P, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, 3-phosphoglycerate, 2-phosphoglycerate, phosphoenyl pyruvate to pyruvate. That's glycolysis. And you can see in this case, it kind of snakes around through here, comes to pyruvate here. We're first going to, let's look at glucose first. And let's look at it in the context of ATP production. The first step of glycolysis is glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. 
that conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate requires an ATP to phosphorylate glucose. So this is step number one. We know that step number one can be done by either glucokinase or hexokinase, depending on the tissue. Now we have glucose 6-phosphate. And we've already used one ATP. So in the next part of this, we go from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Okay? That reaction simply rearranges the molecule to generate fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate is then converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That's another key step of glycolysis. That requires ATP. So at this point, we've used a second ATP. So we have invested two ATP. Remember that? This is the in, these are the investment steps or investment phase of glycolysis. Glucose to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is then split to form DHAP, which is dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. These two 3-carbon molecules are made from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Okay, so one of the phosphates ends up on DHAP, the other one ends up on glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. These two molecules are always in equilibrium. In other words, they can convert back and forth. Okay, now Once you have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, it's converted to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So another phosphate is added, and that's right here. The phosphate is an inorganic phosphate. In other words, it doesn't come from ATP. It's a standalone phosphate. Okay, so we do not need another ATP here. This reaction is an important one. This is step 6 of glycolysis, and it is a step where G3P is actually oxidized. So electrons are removed from G3P, they're added to NAD. NAD becomes NADH plus H. In the process, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is formed. Okay? That molecule then is converted to 3-phosphoglycerate. That generates an ATP. So we have our first ATP that's produced. 3-phosphoglycerate is converted to 2-phosphoglycerate. That's converted to phosphoenyl pyruvate, and that is converted to pyruvate. In the conversion of phosphoenyl pyruvate to pyruvate, a second ATP is generated. So these are the ATP generating steps of glycolysis. These latter steps will generate 2 ATP for every G3P that goes through these. So if we look at this overall ATP production, we invested two ATP up here per glucose. We get two ATP back here, but we do these latter steps twice. Because when we split fructose 1,6-bisphosphoglycerate, sorry, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we get a DHAP and a G3P. G3P then converts through here, and then DHAP follows. So DHAP then goes to G3P, and then it goes through. So all six carbons from here end up as pyruvate. So we do these latter steps twice, and we generate two pyruvate. That means in these latter steps, we generate four ATP. Because we invested two here, that's a net ATP production of plus 2. It's called by substrate level phosphorylation. And the reason that that's worded that way is here's the substrate for phosphorylation, that's ADP. That generates ATP when you phosphorylate it. So that happens four times down here. There's one here, one here, and then you duplicate that, you do that twice.
There's also the potential for more ATP to be produced because of this NADH. And we'll see that's more of an indirect. Generating ATP from this step, this NADH in step six, requires aerobic conditions. So under anaerobic conditions, the net ATP production per glucose is plus two. Under aerobic conditions, we can make more. Okay, the other thing I want you to do on your slide is cross this out. Here's a hexose monophosphate shunt, get rid of that. But I want you to add one thing, and that is draw an arrow from glucose one phosphate, put like a bi-directional arrow to glycogen. Okay, so glycogen basically comes from glucose 1-phosphate. And if you notice, when glucose goes into cell, it can convert to glucose 6-phosphate, then glucose 1-phosphate, and then glycogen. And we know from what we just went through that that glycogen is an option in muscle cells and liver cells. That's it. But if you look at this, could galactose then contribute to glycogen formation? It can because galactose can go into a cell, convert to glucose 1-phosphate, and then become glycogen. So we'll talk about that more. The other thing to note is here's fructose. So we're going to talk about how fructose enters into glycolysis um, towards the end of this lecture. Okay, so let's move on. Here's what I was just talking about as far as ATP production and from um, glycolysis. Step one, step three, we actually utilize ATP. Step six is the NADH step, and then step seven, we actually, it's repeated twice, so we get two ATP, and then step 10 is repeated twice, so we have to, we get another uh, two ATP from that. So there's two ATP via substrate level phosphorylation and glycolysis. Now, we're going to talk about a process called the melee dispartate shuttle. And um, let's see. We're going to talk about what happens to this NADH. One of the things I think you already you, you already covered this in biochemistry and that I also went through in uh, the last slides that we just talked about, basically this one, is we said that electron transport chain can generate a lot of ATP. One of the molecules that's involved in that is NADH because it can uh, move electrons uh, to ETC. We know ETC takes place in the mitochondrial matrix and yet glycolysis is in the cytosol. So this NADH is in the cytosol. It, it, is not in the proper location to donate electrons to ETC. So what cells can do is during aerobic conditions, they can actually, they have a mechanism of transferring these electrons into the mitochondrial matrix. And that's the melee dispartate shuttle. So the main function of the melee dispartate shuttle is to transport electrons from NADH in the cytosol to NADH in the mitochondrial matrix to maximize ATP production. Okay, so here's how it works. Let's, let me orient what this slide, uh, show you what this slide is uh, trying to indicate. This is, see where it says mitochondrial membrane? This is actually the mitochondrial inner membrane right here. Cytosol of the cell matrix. So they're not showing the outer membrane. Remember we said the outer membrane of the mitochondria is relatively porous. And the inner membrane is non-porous.
Basically, molecules do not go through that mitochondrial inner membrane unless they have a transporter. Okay? Um, and I can actually, let's simplify this a little bit. So you can draw a diagram that has mitochondrial inner membrane. You can just draw this. You don't have to remember the name of this carrier or transporter. Okay, but if you want, you can say the malate transporter. Here's another protein or transporter. This one actually transports aspartic acid or aspartate. Now here's the cytosol. Here is the NADH that was generated in the cytosol from step six of glycolysis. Okay. Here's oxaloacetate, which in this case is in the cytosol. In the cytosol, oxaloacetate can be reduced to malate. And let, let's follow these electrons. Let's remember, if we're reducing a molecule, we're adding electrons to it. So if you want to put little, two little dots right here at NADH, that'll represent two electrons. Put a little dot, two dots here. Then those electrons are added to oxaloacetate. That generates malate. So put two little dots here. So now your electrons are on malate. When you oxidize NADH, when you, in other words, when you remove electrons, it becomes NAD, NAD+. Okay. Now that malate has a transporter. NADH can't go across the mitochondrial inner membrane, but malate can. So the cell can take the electrons from NADH, add it to malate, transport malate into the mitochondrial matrix. Once malate goes in the matrix, it's oxidized. So the electrons from malate are added to NAD, which reduces it to NADH. So now put your two little dots right here, because now your electrons are on the NADH here. That NADH can now contribute electrons to ETC. Why? Because it's in the matrix. So now you can take this NADH if you want, put a little arrow and say to ETC. And you remember from biochemistry, every time NADH contributes electrons to ETC, there's the potential to make three ATP. So you can say NADH oops, to ETC for three ATP. Now this happens in aerobic conditions because in aerobic conditions, the ETC is running. So if you think about what's happened is glycolysis has generated electrons that are then transferred indirectly into the mitochondrial matrix and then the electrons end up with ETC. So we get more ATP out of it. And remember every time glycolysis runs that step, step six, this can happen. So in glycolysis if we do this step twice, every time we have a glucose molecule, then we have the potential of making six more ATP from anaerobic metabolism using the malate aspartate shuttle. So this is a way that the cells can maximize ATP production. So let's finish this up. So now what happens is the malate was oxidized, the electrons were added in AD to become NADH, that converts malate to oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate can then be converted to aspartate, which is an amino acid. Aspartic acid has a transporter. So we can go back into cytosol. In cytosol, aspartic acid is converted to oxaloacetate. And then this can repeat. So here's a question. Is there a transporter for NADH in the mitochondrial inner membrane? The answer is no.
In ADH does not have a transporter, so what the cell does is it utilizes molecules that do have mitochondrial intermembrane transporters. And that would be malate and aspartate. So this is called the malate aspartate shuttle. Got it? Okay. So if you want, we can go through some that again in class if you need to. Oh, here's a good diagram. This shows NAD and NADH. And a couple points on this. NAD, you've probably heard that term a lot. Well, NAD is stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Kind of a mouthful. What does that mean? Nicotinamide is, is here. And as it's, you can probably infer from the name, that comes from niacin. All right, we call that niacin from our diet. Niacin is actually, has a couple different forms, and one of them is nicotinamide. So here's nicotinamide. This is a part of the molecule that actually is involved in carrying electrons. When nicotinamide is attached through ribose to pyrophosphate, the pyrophosphates, remember pyro means two phosphates, those are considered nucleotides. Here's ribose and adenine. So that's why this molecule is called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. NAD. Okay. Now, here's the difference. If we look at this molecule here, oops, see this green area? This is the nicotinamide. It's the part, this ring structure is what's involved in accepting and donating electrons. So here's NAD. So this is nicotinamide, and this is in its oxidized form. And in its oxidized form, that nitrogen has four covalent bonds, so that gives the nitrogen a, a positive charge. Remember, formal charges from chemistry. Um, this NAD portion can accept two electrons from hydrogens. And if you remember from chemistry, hydrogen is the simplest atom, and hydrogen is simply a proton in its nucleus and one electron. So here's hydrogen. This dot represents the electron. Here's two hydrogens. When NAD is reduced, one of the hydrogens is added right here. Right here. The other hydrogen is split into its proton, which is written H+. Plus. And its electron is actually added, I think it's here. That, redu that removes that double bond, changes the nitrogen, now no longer has a positive charge. Okay? So when we reduce NAD, we get NADH plus a proton. That's why it's written NADH plus proton, plus H, sometimes it's said. Okay? Now, this is a big molecule. It doesn't go across the mitochondrial inner membrane, but there is NAD in the cytosol and the matrix. Okay? So anyway, that's how that works. And just kind of in context, background information, here's FAD. Here's the other one that you talk about in biochemistry. Remember in FAD, we said, oh, if we have FAD and it's converted to FADH2, FADH2 can be used to generate two ATP. And FAD, as the name implies, or sorry, stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. It comes from riboflavin. So here's FAD. Here's riboflavin. Here's a pyrophosphate. And here is adenine. So it, that's why it's called flavin, flavin, adenine, dinucleotide, pyrophosphate. So it kind of does the same thing as NAD, but its structure is different, and so different enzymes use it. But its use of electrons is a little bit simpler. In this case, FAD is the oxidized form. The reduced form is FADH2, which is shown here. All right, and that one, uh, we'll talk more about FADH2.
Again, FAD doesn't go across the mitochondrial inner membrane. So it's in the matrix of the mitochondria. All right, so a little bit more on that coming up. Okay, let's talk about the regulation of metabolic pathways. Again, that's kind of going to be a focus of the way we go through this. So, a few basic regulatory mechanisms are used to control flux through the pathways. So, this is when you can go back and read um, chapter one, the section on catalytic proteins and enzymes on page 17, in addition to what's in chapter three. So when we talked about chapter one at the beginning of the quarter, I said only read up to like page 12. Uh, don't read the last part of the chapter. Well, now you can backtrack and read the part of the chapter that has to do with regulation of metabolic pathways, and you'll see where it starts. Uh, re so read those few pages. I'm going to go through this pretty briefly. Here's a few key points. Most enzymatic reactions are reversible. I don't know if you realize that before, but for example, if you look at even glycolysis, Reversible means they're bidirectional. So if you look at this, for example, oh boy, sorry, glucose 6 to fructose 6 phosphate, see the way bidirectional arrow? That means one enzyme can run this either way. That's really common. In other words, conversion of A to B done by one enzyme, same enzyme, can go B to A. B to C, if we look at this, this is a unidirectional reaction. In other words, one enzyme runs it this way. If this reaction needs to run the opposite direction, in this case, it needs two enzymes. One would convert B to C, the other enzyme would convert C to B. Okay, that's less common than bidirectional reactions or reversible reactions. Again, C to D, D to C, same enzyme. D to E, E to D, same enzyme. So one of the points of this is at locations of unidirectional reactions, and again, we can say a unidirectional reaction is an irreversible reaction. That means one enzyme runs it in one direction, and it's irreversible unless you have a second enzyme. So if you want to regulate, let's say, for example, the use of A to eventually make E, so let's say this is our metabolic pathway, if you want to control the, or regulate this metabolic flow from A to E, the best point of regulation is between B and C. Because if I upregulate the enzyme that converts B to C, I'm kind of pushing the flux or direction of this to E. If I re upregulate the enzyme that does C to D, once I get more D, it'll kind of revert back to C. So I'm really not controlling the direction of this metabolic pathway. So in general, the irreversible reactions, or the universal, or sorry, or the unidirectional reactions are the points of regulation in metabolic pathways. Okay? So once we know that, let's talk about how, for example, that enzyme can be regulated. Controlling an enzyme's activity in an irreversible step provides regulation of metabolic pathway, and there are several ways to control enzymatic activity. We're going to look at a couple of them. Here's an overall diagram showing the regulation of metabolic pathways. For example, we have DNA over here. We know they're going from DNA to mRNA as transcription. And then once we have mRNA, we can translate that into an enzyme. The enzyme can then be regulated by several different ways. It can be associated with a regulatory protein. It can be sequestered in a certain compartment in a cell. So if it's not in the same part of a cell as the metabolic pathway, it's separated or sequestered, it's not going to have an effect on that metabolic pathway. So cells can sometimes move enzymes around. Okay, 
We're going to focus on these bottom two, though. Allosteric regulation, covalent modification. Extremely common ways that enzymes' activity are regulated. Another thing that a cell can do is basically just turn over or degrade the enzyme into amino acids, and that decreases the enzyme's levels and activity. So we're going to talk about a couple of these ways. Um, first of all, enzyme induction. Enzyme induction basically means synthesis of the enzyme. That's often through gene expression. So if we have, let's say, an enzyme's gene that's transcribed and then translated, in general, the more transcription we have, the more translation we have, and the more enzyme we have. So sometimes an enzyme's activity is regulated by just making more of the enzyme. Now that's a relatively slow process compared to the other ways, because the enzyme has to basically be made and then become active and then perform its function. That's often due to hormones that affect gene expression. So for example, sometimes insulin does that. It'll increase expression of a particular enzyme. Um, again, relatively effective but slow mechanism of, of regulation. Bullet points two and three are something we're gonna focus on as well because they tend to be faster. Some enzymes are allosteric enzymes. Remember, an allosteric enzyme has modulators that bind to the enzyme's allosteric site and affect its activity. I'll detail that in a second. Another way of level of modification or regulation is covalent modification. The most common type is phosphorylation. Remember, this is when an enzyme is actually phosphorylated and that regulates its activity. Extremely common. Let's look at these two things. Here's allosteric. Now, remember, not all enzymes are allosteric enzymes. An allosteric enzyme has an active site and an allosteric site. The allosteric site is a regulatory site. Some molecules bind to the enzyme's allosteric site. Those molecules can be referred to as modulators. So this is when the binding of a modulator affects the enzyme's activity by altering the shape of the enzyme and therefore its active site. Modulators can be positive or negative when they bind. So here's an example of structural change. This enzyme, let's see, what is this? I think this is a spartate transaminase. Space, space filling model here of an enzyme in one form it is then allosterically altered to another form. See the structure of the enzyme changes, and because of that, the structure around its active site changes, activity of the enzyme changes. It's kind of an on-off switch. Classic diagram here from biochemistry text. This is probably my favorite biochemistry text, Leninger. Um, here we have a allosteric enzyme. It has a catalytic subunit. In other words, here's the active site. Regulatory subunit. In other words, allosteric site. Here's the structure of the enzyme in its less active form. Okay. This enzyme is going to bind a positive modulator. Or modulators can either be positive or negative. In this case, we're looking at a positive modulator. This molecule modulator binds the allosteric site, you can see, structure of the enzyme changes. Slightly alters the substrate binding site, in other words, the active site. So we go from a less active structure to a more active structure of the enzyme because the modulator is bound. Now the enzyme binds substrate more effectively and will convert substrate to product. Okay, so this is an example of a positive modulator. Here's covalent modification. It's called covalent modification because a phosphate group is covalently added to the side chains of amino acids, right? Serine, threonine, and tyrosine are amino acids. So this is where phosphates are added to side chains of serine, threonine, or tyrosine because those amino acids contain a hydroxyl group which can easily receive or be bound to a phosphate. 
And remember, enzymes that add phosphates to other molecules are generally called kinases. Adding or removing phosphates to amino acids of enzymes, so in other words, phosphorylating an enzyme, can change the shape of the enzyme and affect its activity. So enzymes can be turned on or off by phosphorylation. Now, hormones often use this mechanism to regulate an enzyme's activity as well. So let's look at the diagram here. Again, I think this is from Leninger. Here is the enzyme structure. This is in its less active form. This enzyme happens to be what's called glycogen phosphorylase. And it's showing here, this enzyme actually has, it's a dimer. It has two enzymes of its same structure that are bound together. This where it says serine 14, that means this is the 14th amino acid in its structure. Side chain of serine involves, has a CH2 and a hydroxyl group. So this has two subunits, each has a serine, each can be phosphorylated. So now if you look down here, phosphate group added. Now obviously that changes the kind of the ionics of this enzyme because we have a kind of a polar hydroxyl group here. When you add that phosphate, phosphates are negatively charged. And one of the things we've said in this class and you learned in biochemistry is it's the interactions of the amino acid side chains that determine a structure, the structure of a protein. So if you change the side chain of some of the amino acids, you can affect the structure of the protein. The change in this case is a phosphate being added. So we go from this shape of the enzyme to this structure of the enzyme. The enzyme becomes more active because of this phosphorylation. Now, the name of these kinases is often determined by its substrate. So in this case, this enzyme is called glycogen phosphorylase. The enzyme that adds the phosphate would be called glycogen phosphorylase kinase. All right, here we go with uh, kind of sometimes confusing and long enzyme names, glycogen phosphorylase kinase, because it's adding phosphates to glycogen phosphorylase. Phosphates generally come from ATP. So in this case, two phosphates are added, so two ATP are required. Those convert to two ADP. Now, this is covalent. Covalent bond is formed between the phosphate and the oxygen here. So in order to dephosphorylate, we need another enzyme. That enzyme would be called glycogen phosphorylase phosphatase. Phosphatases remove phosphates. That inactivates the enzyme. Now, if you think about this, one of the advantages is it's fast because you have an enzyme already made and you're just turning it on or off. And remember, in this case, the phosphorylation is activating the enzyme. In some cases, phosphorylation inactivates the enzyme. So it can be either on or off. We just have to remember which is which on specific examples. Okay, pretty simple, I hope. So let's talk about the regulation of glycolysis. We're going to focus on two key points. One is step one, which is glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And we know that that's done by either glucokinase or hexokinase. Okay. Then we're going to look at step three of glycolysis, which is done by an enzyme called phosphofructokinase 1, PFK1. And that's the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That's the number three reaction. So let's focus on the first one. We've already talked about these enzymes, um, hexokinase and glucokinase. Remember, hexokinase is present in muscle and adipose, negatively regulated by glucose 6-phosphate, feedback inhibition. Hexokinase has a lower KM than glucokinase. We'll talk about that in one second. Glucokinase is expressed in the liver and, you know, pancreatic beta cells. It's not negatively regulated by glucose 6-phosphate. We know it has a higher KM than hexokinase. Okay, so this is a key point in glycolysis regulation. 
Phosphorylating glucose to glucose 6-phosphate basically metabolically traps the glucose 6-phosphate and provides substrate that can enter glycolysis. Let's talk a little bit more about KMs, and this might be something I need to review in class. We'll see how this goes. Um, these are basically um, KM curves for hexokinase and glucokinase. Let's focus on, and I maybe write this in your notes, KM equals one-half substrate concentration, sorry, KM equals substrate concentration at one-half Vmax. KM equals substrate concentration at one-half Vmax. Now let's look at glucokinase first. When we draw these out in biochemistry, you draw this line, you'd say here's my Vmax or velocity, you put that on the y axis. Down here we say, what do we call this one? Substrate concentration. In this case, the substrate's glucose. When we draw this curve, we call this, this is the michaelis minton kind of curve. And we know that as we add substrate in general, velocity of the reaction goes up. We talk about the reaction, we're going from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. So in general, the more substrate we have, the more glucose 6-phosphate we generate until it kind of falls off. And remember, that falling off kind of represents saturation of the enzyme. Because when you do these enzyme kinetics, we're keeping enzyme concentration constant, we're increasing substrate. So the enzyme that we have in our reaction can become saturated with substrate. That's when this kind of starts falling off. When we look at substrate concentration here, so we know that, for example, Km equals substrate concentration at 1 half Vmax. In this case, what we're looking at is our velocity is on the y-axis. So if we look at here, here's our 1 half Vmax right here. If we go across here and then drop down, here's our substrate concentration at 1 half Vmax, which equals the Km. So here's the curve for glucokinase and here's the Km for glucokinase, 10 millimolars of glucose. 10 millimole glucose, sorry. We know glucokinase is in the liver. Now, this isn't very interesting to me at all until we put this in the context of our body and basic physiology of our body. Here's a normal fasting blood glucose level. And we're going to say this is about 4 millimolar. So during fasting, is glucokinase functioning anywhere near its maximal velocity. No, it's only operating about 25, maybe 30% maximum velocity. In other words, during fasting, the kinase in liver cells is nowhere near its maximal velocity. Why does that matter? It's common that after a meal, that, that glucose concentration in the blood is gonna go up significantly. Let's say it goes up twofold. Let's say it goes up two and a half fold, which is relatively common, right? Let's say it's 70 milligrams per deciliter initially, then you eat a big meal, well, it's easy for it to go up, say, 150 to 200 mg per deciliter, okay? So let's say we have that big increase in blood glucose, let's say it goes to 10, two and a half fold. How fast is the enzyme working? Half as fast as it can. Is it anywhere near saturation? Nope. So because of the high Km of glucokinase, postprandial glucose is relatively easily phosphorylated by glucokinase to generate glucose 6-phosphate. Okay? So postprandial, the liver glucokinase, 
and the pancreatic beta cell glucokinase can phosphorylate significant amounts of glucose to set it up for glycolysis. Let's look at hexokinase. Different enzyme, but does the same reaction. Glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And fasting blood glucose concentration of 4 millimolar, look how fast glucokinase is, at, is working relative to its max. This blue line represents the KM curve of hexokinase. Even at fasting, hexokinase is working almost 90% its maximum velocity. Now, postprandial, what happens? Well, let's say it goes up to 10. Can hexokinase increase its activity very much? No. Why is the saturation level of these so different? And that has to do with affinity. So in general, when an enzyme has a high, F, high KM, it has a low affinity. In other words, for it to work fast, it doesn't bind substrate very tightly. Another way of looking at that though is in order for that enzyme to work effectively, it has to have high amounts of substrate. Hexokinase actually works effectively at a low glucose concentration. Which means when blood glucose is low, hexokinase can effectively phosphorylate it in case those muscle cells need glucose. Postprandial though, overall you can say, well, the liver probably has the advantage because you can now phosphorylate more of that glucose and basically store it in the liver. And that's important, right? Because during fasting, the liver could have already taken up and stored glucose from the last time that you had that glucose. Okay. So... Wait, let's look at this. Backtrack a little bit. Again, one of the things I had you change on your uh, diagram here was that we said glucose 6-phosphate can become glucose 1-phosphate. That can go to glycogen. So now in a liver cell that's postprandial, when it has lots of glucose, it can phosphorylate it. Even if glycolysis isn't going to be running at a high level, that liver cell can then go glucose 6-phosphate by glucokinase to glucose 1-phosphate to glycogen. So the liver can store that glycogen in case we need it later. Okay? Kind of interesting. Let's look at the next point of regulation of glycolysis. This is the major point. Fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is the single most important regulatory mechanism of glycolysis. So when I ask you the most important regulatory point of glycolysis, you're going to say at PFK1. And again, let's call this, make sure we call phosphofructokinase 1, PFK1, because there is a PFK2. And it's a different enzyme. First committed step in glycolysis. This enzyme is controlled by both allosteric and hormonal mechanisms. So why do we say it's the first committed step? Here's PFK1, fructose 6 to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. PFK1 runs this reaction right here. Once we get here to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, this molecule is going to tend to go through the latter steps of glycolysis. Now that's different than the one that's run by either HK or, or GK, glucokinase, hexokinase, because once you get to glucose 6-phosphate, there's other options. It's not really committed to glycolysis yet. First committed step is basically here. So PFK1 is an important, really important point of regulation. Again, it runs a single reaction in a unidirectional manner. Here's another way of looking at that step. PFK1. Here's allosteric regulation of PFK1. This diagram shows here's glucose, glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Here's PFK1, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Here's PFK1 running this reaction. 
PFK1 is an allosteric enzyme. It has an allosteric site that can bind modulators. Here's some of the modulators. Here's ATP. It is an allosteric modulator of PFK1. So ATP binds the PFK1 allosteric site. It inhibits PFK1 activity. So what it can do is it can actually, when it binds PFK1's active site, it inhibits PFK1 activity. So it changes PFK1 structure, so it inhibits its activity. Does that make sense? It would make sense because when we already have high amounts of ATP in a cell, we don't have to make more ATP. Right? Because glycolysis is important for ATP production. If you already have high amounts of ATP, glycolysis doesn't need to run as actively. Okay? Citrate. In each one of these, you can see in red whether or not, it, it, if it inhibits it, it's shown in red. So citrate inhibits PFK1 activity. So if we go back to this, one of the things that I said was, uh, probably, probably this one. If a cell has had significant energy production and it's gone through glycolysis, for example, in Krebs, if a cell already has significant amounts of energy, it'll actually slow down Krebs by moving citrate from the mitochondria into the cytosol. One of the things that citrate does, it binds PFK1. The citrate will actually slow glycolysis because you don't need to continue to provide substrate to Krebs from glycolysis. So the citrate will leave the mitochondrial matrix and provide feedback on PFK1. So citrate down regulates PFK1 allosterically. Now ADP. When ADP goes up, that represents low energy status in a cell. And that means that we need to stimulate pathways that can generate more energy, and that means glycolysis. That's one of them. So ADP upregulates PFK1 activity, stimulates it allosterically. Now let's look over here. The fourth one we're going to talk about here. Fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate shown here. Here's glycolysis. It goes fructose 6 to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. There's also an alternative reaction. Fructose 6 can be converted to fructose 6-bisphosphate instead of 1,6. So it's phosphorylated on number 2 carbon instead of carbon number 1. This is an important feed-forward regulatory molecule. When fructose 6-phosphate goes up significantly, some of it is converted to fructose 2,6. Fructose 2,6 is a positive modulator of PFK1. It basically indicates to PFK1 that there is significant substrate available. As a matter of fact, fructose 2,6 bisphosphate is probably the most potent stimulator of PFK1 activity allosterically. Okay. Guess the name of the enzyme that converts fructose 6 to fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. That's PFK2. That's why we want to make sure we always say PFK1 instead of just PFK. Okay? Alright. How else is PFK1 re regulated? Well, hormonally. Insulin increases activity due to increased enzyme concentration. That's what that means. So in other words, insulin increases gene expression of PFK1. And the more PFK1 you have, potentially the more PFK1 activity you have. So insulin increases PFK1 activity and basically glycolysis. Does that make sense? When blood glucose goes up, insulin goes up. Insulin is basically activating PFK1 because there's substrate for glycolysis in cells. So insulin helps 
the glucose go into the cells and then run it through glycolysis by upregulating PFK1. Next one that's shown here is glucagon. And as you would suspect, glucagon does the opposite. It actually represses PFK1 activity. So when blood glucose is down, glycolysis is usually downregulated um, by glucagon. And glucagon tends to do this by decreasing levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And by doing that, it decreases PFK1 activity. Okay, so glucagon represses PFK1 activity by decreasing fructose 2,6-bisphosphate levels. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's do a couple more slides here. We'll finish this up. The fate of pyruvate. There's three general fates of pyruvate. Remember, glycolysis generates pyruvate. Pyruvate has a few different options. Under anaerobic conditions, I think we remember that pyruvate becomes lactate. Pyruvate, under aerobic conditions, we know pyruvate generally goes to acetyl-CoA. Now, pyruvate is also involved in amino acid metabolism. So pyruvate can be converted to alanine. And alanine can be converted to pyruvate. So one thing to look at here, for example, do I have it? Yeah, I guess we could look at it here. One of the amino acids that converted to pyruvate is alanine. Alanine can become pyruvate, and then pyruvate can basically become acetyl-CoA um, under aerobic conditions. It can go this way. Under anaerobic conditions, that alanine becomes pyruvate in the liver cells, basically. That pyruvate could convert to gluconeogenesis if necessary. So alanine is a good example of how uh, some amino acids are involved in energy production, but also glucose production. So can carbons from alanine be used to make glucose? Yes, in liver cells. Because liver cells can do gluconeogenesis. Okay, let's look at fructose. Now, we'll do fructose and galactose, and then we're done with this one. So here's fructose, and, and one of the points of this is, you know, we hear a lot about a, of information about why fructose is considered to be harmful. Too much high fructose corn syrup, too much fructose in your diet can lead to uh, negative effects. Is that true? Well, partially, it can be. So let's look specifically in how that can happen. And first of all, what are some significant sources of fructose in our diet, right? We mentioned high fructose corn syrup. Probably the most common one is gonna be sucrose. But we know fructose is also in fruit and things like honey can be significant sources of fructose. Now, one of the things we said last lecture is that when we consume fructose, it goes through the enterocytes into the portal vein and almost all fructose is taken up by liver cells. When it goes into that liver cell, here's how it's metabolized. So when we look at this diagram, and what I did was I cut off the first couple steps of glycolysis. So we're just looking at the later steps of glycolysis. So here's fructose in the blood. And see where it says liver, and that says major. So just focus on this one, because almost all that fructose in the blood is going to be taken up and metabolized by the liver. This is minor. If there is any fructose in the blood, it can also go into muscles and kidney cells, but this is a minor pathway. When fructose goes into liver cells, it's phosphorylated by fructokinase. Fructokinase converts fructose to fructose 1-phosphate, utilizing an ATP molecule. So fructose goes in, we know it goes through GLUT2, into the liver cell, fructokinase phosphorylates it. I should probably move that. Oops. Fructokinase is right here, converts it to fructose 1-phosphate. Fructose 1-phosphate is then split. 
into glyceraldehyde and DHAP. See the way this splits? DHAP is a glycolytic molecule. Glyceraldehyde is not. So glyceraldehyde is phosphorylated, converted to G3P. When that happens, all six of the carbons from fructose are in glycolysis. So fructose can enter glycolysis. How many ATP does it take? One here, one here. So two, same as glucose. It requires the same ATP investment as glucose. Here's a big difference between fructose and glucose. Look where it enters glycolysis. Below PFK1. So fructose enters glycolysis below the main regulatory point of glycolysis. In other words, if significant amounts of fructose are entering into a liver cell, it will enter glycolysis, go to pyruvate, and then become acetyl-CoA. Even under conditions where the liver cell already has significant amounts of ATP and energy. Which means there's no down regulation of fructose metabolism. If we go back here, We said before that if there's significant amounts of energy already in a cell, I'm looking at the liver cell here, citrate can be released into the cytosol. And I just said a couple minutes ago that when citrate goes into cytosol, it can de decrease PFK1 activity. That doesn't matter for fructose. So the citrate, let's say fructose is entering here becoming citrate, citrates becoming palmitate, fatty acids, triglycerides, it'll continue to do that for fructose. Now if that's glucose coming in, then the glucose can be down regulated because of PFK1. So glucose will go to glucose 6-phosphate and basically won't become pyruvate, could be channeled to glycogen. Whereas fructose would continue to go in become fatty acids because the fructose is not susceptible to PFK1 regulation. And that can be a problem. Now, in general, fructose is not going to be problematic unless it's consumed with significant other calories. Or there's significantly high levels of fructose. So some fructose in our diet, I'd say overall, is fine. But when fructose is consumed in the combination of really high amounts of fructose or really high amounts of calories, then fructose can be problematic. And some of the things that high, those conditions have, have been related to is um, A high fructose, high calorie diet can, can sometimes increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. And there's some animal evidence for that and some, I'd say, some um, human data for that as well. So it can be related to type 2 diabetes. Another thing that it can be related to is some, some evidence, and this is fairly recent. I haven't, not exactly sure. Um, how much of this has actually been completely figured out yet. But there was a few fairly recent studies that showed that high fructose may decrease the leptin signaling. And if you remember back from 210, leptin is a hormone that tends to control appetite. So some studies have shown that, that high fructose may kind of compromise the leptin signaling. And so it's not very good for appetite suppression. So... Those are some of the downsides of that. And so 
one of the things to keep in mind is under certain conditions, fructose can be problematic. So I think it's something people need to be conscious of because um, it may increase the risk of things like type 2 diabetes or even cardiovascular disease. But um, again, overall, we want to make sure it's looked at in the context of of um, the rest of our diet as well. So let's look at galactose. Where are some of the major sources of galactose in the diet? Well, it's mostly in, uh, from lactose in milk. And galactose metabolism is a little bit different than um, especially fructose metabolism. If we look at the top of this, here's galactose. And again, we're talking about liver cells. Galactose goes in. It's converted to galactose 1-phosphate by galactokinase. And then that can be converted to glucose 1-phosphate once you get to glucose 1-phosphate, you can go to glycogen. So some of that galactose that goes into liver cells is relatively easily converted to glycogen. Some of it's converted to glucose 6-phosphate. That glucose 6-phosphate can go into glycolysis. So essentially, galactose can be converted and used for glycolysis. Now, galactose can also, once it becomes glucose 6-phosphate, um, glucose 6-phosphate can be converted to glucose and then glucose can enter into the blood and again this is from the liver so a couple of ways to look at this is galactose is more supportive of glycogen and blood glucose than fructose for example because of where it comes in for glycolysis and again if we look back here here's galactose phosphorylated comes in glucose one phosphate can go to glycogen or it could go this way to glucose 6-phosphate. One of the things we'll talk about next time is glucose 6-phosphate in liver cells can be converted to glucose and then put back into the blood. Okay? And remember, that's different from fructose. Fructose is down here. All right. So I think that, that wraps this up. And I'd say that's probably enough for this. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording. And um, I hope that was effective, and so I will see you guys soon.